Good morning, everyone. I have started the recording. We'll get things underway. I want to welcome everyone that was able to attend and start out with a big thank you, uh, you to the, the great Rainmaker. And you're welcome. We made the connections as of last meeting. And my rain gauge for the month of May so far, I have 3.1 inches of rain. So uh, I don't know that uh, all of you received that kind of rain, but I heard wish we had four or five inches of snow this morning. The back Black Hills had 12, 13 inches of snow. And so there's certainly some moisture in that. Is there anything before we get started with Adnan that you'd like to add to the agenda? Anybody can type in or chime in at this time. Not seeing anything. Well, of course, you can always add to it later on. I thought it might be appropriate uh, at the end if there's a livestock update uh, related to the avian flu influenza that anybody would want to give following the uh, following the weather update. So, uh, just in a quick way of an introduction, you have uh, specialists Miranda Meehan and Carl Dahl, along with myself at the uh, in the office, along with Charlie Stolt now. Alan Crawford and Sonia Fox, and uh, after after the uh, drought progress and seven-day forecast, we'll go around the horn for regional regional updates. Ednan, I'd like to turn it over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, joining. Uh, this is the end on two-day uh, total precipitation map. And we are looking at 2.6 inch in Edgeley, 2.46 in Oaks, and 2.15 inch just of rain in um, Brampton. And those are the locations that had received the most. Uh, that is indicated by the red. And as you see, uh, the south and eastern portion of the state did receive a significant amount of precipitation during the, the past couple days. And, and this is the precipitation totals uh, since last we met. Um, and actually, it is the last seven days. And again, uh, these areas did receive significant amounts. And since we last met last time, um, and again, these areas did receive a lot of rainfall. And looking at the stream flows in the, uh, across the state, um, up until two days ago, the Red River in the, uh, the from the south to the north were running between 9 percentile to 13 percentile. That means Red River was running um, only 9 percent of the time that was lower. But as you see, uh, the numbers are really bouncing off. In Fargo, for example, 58 percentile. That means um, near normal uh, conditions. Um, going to forecast. I'm going to show the seven-day forecast first. Um, those of you who are receiving rainfall is not going to like this forecast because uh, the portion that had received a lot of rain is going to continue to have a lot of rain. Um, my computer is trying to boot that area. And earlier when I looked, here it is. I'm going to click on the seven-day forecast. The areas indicated in dark uh, magenta colors are in between the 2.6 inch or 2.8. Um, this is the seven day total and the maximum amount. And again, it is a southeastern portion of the state. As you move from southeast to northwest, uh, the amount will be decreased. This is the seven day forecast. And if I print in, if I clicked on the daily uh, forecast precipitation, you would see almost every day that you will see. Uh, some rain. Um, fortunately, this current system is going to get out of our area uh, by midnight today, but the new system is going to start coming in from the southwest. Uh, so this is a rainy next seven-day period. Um, I did travel to Oaks last week, and I noticed that in the fields it is um, the opposite of drought, really. The, the fields were wet, and I heard from the local um, farmers that they have been having some problem getting into the field uh, because it is too wet and they are afraid to get stuck. 
Um, I am going to show you the drought monitor that may not reflect your current conditions because uh, most rains did come after the cutoff dateline or when this, uh, when this map is produced. So I'm going to listen to what you will say and adjust this map based on the outcome. So I would appreciate as well as the drought impact, which may not be the case, um, the anything that you may say is going to change this map and I will be listening. Um, I'm going to give control back to uh, you, JW. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Adnan? Well, hearing none, let's take a quick trip around the state and, and get a bird's eye view or at least a 30,000 foot view of what it what the, the, the landscape looks like. And this morning, let's start in the uh, great northwest. Anybody from the northwest? Minot Experiment Station or North Central Experiment Station at Minot or others that would like to add some comments this morning? Yeah, this is Chris. Can you hear me, JW? Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Um, and we got about three quarters of an inch at the research center over the past few days. Uh, I think Wednesday when the rain hit, the, the news uh, station that's a couple miles north of here, they were talking two inches, so um, pretty variable out this way, but um, a similar situation as, as last time as I've been running around soil sampling, uh, digging in the ground with farmers and that. Um, top six inches or so is pretty dry, but we got lots of subsoil moisture, and I think with this, uh, this rain that we got, we're we got enough to get stuff growing so it could tap into that subsoil moisture. Very good. Anyone else from the Northwest want to supplement those comments? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Identify yourself, please. All right. Yep. Yeah. Um, my name is Cindy Osinoff. I'm calling from Williams County. And I agree with what Chris said. Over the past two weeks, we've got about three fourths of an inch. And, uh, you know, farmers are starting to really kind of wrap up in the fields. We haven't had too many problems you know, with people getting stuck or anything. It's It's been relatively dry, but things are starting to green up here, and I have seen some ranchers start to put cattle on pastures already. Um, not too many, but, you know, it, it's, it's a slow start. They're starting to do it since we've had such nice weather out here. Thank you, Danelle. Carla's comments up there. I see Carla has, uh, Carla Ryan has inserted a comment uh, in the last two weeks. It's starting to green up, but only a drizzle this last week. So it didn't really amount to much there. Again, accenting how variable the, the moisture has been to date. Anyone else from the Northwest? Hearing none, let's uh, reverse uh, into a counterclockwise around the state and drop down to the southwest. If anybody from the southwest would like to to comment. <coughs> Dickinson Research Center. This is Chris. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I just kind of did all what Chris said from mine. At, um, we're in about the same shape. Good subsoil moisture. And um, we read some pretty good rain, you know, the last week or so. So um, we're in field work. I can't, haven't been out, but in terms of the field, but certainly a lot of it's going on. So it's um, going good. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else from the uh, southwest? JW, this is Kurt. Can you? Can Go ahead, Kurt. Through? Say, um, yeah, subsoil moisture is very good here. We, uh, from a drought situation out here in the southwest, we've had so much rain the last two years in places we had about 50 inches of moisture that some guys recorded. I'm not sure that, you know, yeah, they're talking some dryness on the top. We have had ha have had a little bit of moisture uh, two weeks ago to alleviate some of that. Uh, last week I was gone all week. I, I, traveled all, I traveled down to Oklahoma City and came back a couple of different routes. Um, 
We're not near as bad as uh, western South Dakota, western Nebraska, uh, Kansas, down in that country. But I think that stuff all got alleviated this past weekend here, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. There were some tremendous rains down in that country. Uh, down in the Phillips, South Dakota country, uh, they've got a lot. They, they got anywhere from an inch to four inches of rain. Um, so it's quite variable. We didn't get anything out here over the weekend. Now, I haven't talked to anybody yet um, south of us, according to the map yesterday. It uh, wasn't too far south of Dickinson, uh, maybe the New England country and on. Um, yeah, they they got hit pretty good. And uh, looking at the news last night, uh, south of Bismarck got hit pretty good. So we're sitting pretty good right now. All right, Kurt, thanks for the update. Anybody else from the southwest? I understand it was snowing during the Mother's Day quarter horse sale down at Bowman. No comment to that? Okay, that'll be fine. We can move on and we'll continue our counterclockwise progression around the state. Puts us into the southeast. Anybody from the southeast like to log in? I'll be watching the monitor if you you unmute your mic. Uh, this is Brian. Can you hear me? Sure can, Brian. Go ahead. Uh, we've got uh, good moisture over the weekend. Uh, started last Wednesday and uh, as of current, I think we're over just over two inches of rain now, or moisture. Um, so we're sitting real good. Uh, most of the guys around here have all their uh, corn in. Um, probably about 50% of the soybeans are in. So uh, we're starting to see things pop up and a lot better story than what we were in a couple weeks ago. Certainly, what a difference uh, a week can make in a little bit of rain. Anybody else from the southeast? This is Kelsey Eglin from Emmons County. Um, well, as of Wednesday to now, uh, Wednesday we got about half an inch. It may have spread out throughout the county and maybe not ever. Some got a little less and some got a little more. Um, in the past, well, let's see, since Friday or so, Saturday since it's been raining, um, we got over an inch and a half, and um, I was driving back yesterday, and everything was white. So I know I think we got about six or so, maybe possibly a little more in some areas. I had heard somebody talk about maybe possibly up to 10, but it was um, it was melting already. So we've got a lot of snow. Everything's starting to green up, um, but it's all melted now in Linton here. Um, and I know that we had people in the field up until Wednesday with the rain. They kind of, uh, they stopped working, and I think we had a little bit on Saturday, and now I just think we'll be having a little time waiting as they're trying to fight with getting stuck and everything. So, Very good. Thanks for that information. I did receive an email from Lisa Peterson, who was in route from South Dakota, pushing snow, but wasn't quite bumper high yet. Um, yeah. But uh, she was fighting some gumbled roads and some wet, sloppy conditions. So certainly south of you, Kelsey, has, has, seen some, has seen some major precipitation in the form of snow as well as rain. Anybody else from the southeast? All right, we'll take up to the northeast. How's the northeast doing? This is Mike Knudsen in Grand Forks County. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Michael. Um, and looking at our end-on station here in Grand Forks, in the last two weeks, we got about three-quarters of an inch of rain, and it was much needed. Um, the wet, cool conditions um, in the forecast is, I'm sure, a little concerning to some producers, but um, once it warms up and dries up, I'm sure they'll finish with uh, getting soybeans in the ground. But other than that, this rain was much needed. And we have had no snow precip, a little bit of sleet this morning. But other than that, that's it. Very good. Thanks for that quick update. Anybody else from the Northeast would like to respond? Yeah, this is Angie Johnson. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Angie, go ahead. 
Well, good morning, everybody. Yeah, up here in Finley, um, I guess it's kind of the same consensus. Uh, last Wednesday in Finley, we saw about um, half an inch of rain. However, uh, towards the south of Steele County, uh, past Hope and, and towards the southern end where I live, uh, we only got about three tenths. And so it kind of, there was a dividing line that was split in the county and, um, you know, it was much they needed. Uh, guys were going right back in the field around Hope again right away. However, up in Finley, we've got plenty of standing water. And so uh, now this morning with the excess moisture, it was sleeting here. It was interesting putting on our winter defensive driving skills back to the test again. But um, it's 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 looking good. Like Michael said, you know, the, the cold temperatures kind of concerns me. Uh, we have had some soybeans in the southern area planted, but however, towards the north, uh, nothing yet, which is, I'm okay with that. You know, when our soil temperature isn't even 50 degrees, that's, that's all right with me. But um, yeah, we're, we've got good moisture. Uh, some of the pastures, I mean, it's gonna take a while to recharge some of those stock ponds, but the grass is sure greening up again and uh, things, are, things are looking good. Very good, Angie. Thanks for that update. Anybody else? Last call, anybody else from the Northeast? I see Lindy from Towner has inserted a comment. Pretty much the same here. So it looks like conditions are fairly uniform in, in that district. Speaking of defensive winter driving skills, uh, our extension veterinarian, Jerry Stucka, just joined us. I know he was driving, battling some, uh, some snow this morning as when he left the farm. Any observations you made in the way? I noticed as my drive by Gray City this weekend, there was a cows on pasture, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you uh, when you ask for moisture, it comes in all different forms, and we've certainly seen it. It rained, and light rain, very nice soft rain over the weekend, and then today it started to snow probably over by Pillsbury, and then snowed all the way to Page and, and beyond, and and then little bursts of snow. In fact, some of the ground was completely white as I was driving by. Seemed a little bit abnormal for May 11th, but we do live in North Dakota, so I guess in that respect, all forms of moisture are certainly welcome. But there is water standing in the fields, which tells you that there's been pretty adequate moisture. So it's uh, it's still welcome. It just makes it a little uncomfortable for us at times. and. For those that are still calving, it makes those calves a little cold, but they'll they'll be okay. Anybody else out in the state? Any remaining comments before I bring it to the table here in, in Fargo? Craig put a comment. Okay, I see. Craig just came across uh, about 40 hundreds. Farmers planting like crazy. Three inches in some places. Okay. Anybody else? like to add to the conversation yeah, right. before we move on. Yeah, this is Craig. I'm Go sorry ahead. I'm a few minutes late this morning, but yeah, here in Mercer County, we only got 40 inches of rain, which was great, but uh, ha we've been plotting all week. The cold weather hasn't seemed to be a concern to the guys. They were going like crazy yesterday when I made a quick uh, trip around the county. But you just go about 20 miles to the west and south of us in Oliver County and over by the Hanover area, and there's places that Rick has confirmed three to four inches of rain, so that shows you how spotty it is. The snow did not make it up here, no snow last night, so kind of a different story in Mercer County. Like I said, we've only gotten 40 inches of rain here in the last week. 40 hundreds. 40 hundreds, you mean. Yes, forty hundred. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's okay. It means we're some. That means that somebody's paying attention. But as we know, we're only in North Dakota. You're only two weeks away from a drought, so <laughs> well, conditions can change quickly. But it appears that that's not the now. case right now. Hopefully, we don't have to have flood meetings in the, in the, in the <laughs> next two weeks. That brings us back to Fargo with the people people sitting around the table. Any open comments? Oh, Carl, I see your comment just popped up on the screen. Forgive me. Yeah, I guess everybody can read that. Wind and wind chill. Half, one and a half inches of rain. Anybody around the table like to comment further regarding uh, livestock conditions, since that seems to be the topic right now? Yeah. 
you know, I, I mean, we are in May. That's a good thing. If this was March or April, I'd be much more concerned. It is supposed to get in the 40s today. I know those calves can be wet, but uh, usually the mother seeks out some type of uh, wind protection, and if you can get out of the wind just a little bit, those calves will be fine as long as they've nursed. Uh, that colostrum is a miracle drug, and, and it just seems to uh, support that body temperature. So I know they'll be uncomfortable for a while, and, and, and in truth, we don't know the total consequences of some of this little chilly weather. Maybe we'll get some, might even get some breaks with a little calf diarrhea, could even get a little breaks with uh, outbreaks of, of, of calf pneumonia. But uh, in truth, there's not a whole lot you can do about it right at this point. But I'm, I'm grateful it's May, and I'm grateful that the temperatures are in the upper 30s and 40s. And it's supposed to be in the 50s tomorrow. 50s and 60s tomorrow, so. Yeah. The, other, the other thing I'd say with that is we might get some breaks, but your, your cow yards and some of these areas that got, you know, three, four inches of rain, those cow yards could be a mess. So if there's anything we can do to to get some get type of dry conditions or get those cattle out. I know we were talking about, you know, some of the sacrifice pastures or something like that um, would be a good idea to get the congestion away. Yep. Anybody else around the table have something they'd like to add? Okay. Well, the conversations have certainly changed since uh, we met two weeks ago. I rescued by rain so uh, I guess uh, listening to comments so far it's just that uh, for your news items going out uh, radio etc talking about preparing for or watching for some of the, the health hazards in the, in the cow yard and, and, op and opportunities to uh, abate any of those anybody else would like to add add to the comments JW, this is Craig. Yes, Craig. I guess on the flip side, on the crop side, I haven't had a chance to look yet, but calls this morning already, people worried about winter kill on alfalfa and winter wheat. People do, I know it was down to 25 degrees here this morning, at least at my house. So I don't know if there's anything they can do about it, but that's the phone calls I had on my answering machine this morning already. Thanks, Craig. I appreciate you bringing that up. We did have some extensive winter kill this spring uh, here and east, uh, as much as 40% in some areas. It seemed to be isolated. And typically, it was the older stands, uh, the, the people that I talked to. This is Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, at least in the research plots. If there were four- and five-year-old stands, there was up to, well, in some cases, up to 90% loss of alfalfa. The younger stands so far seem to be fine. And of course, this was before breaking dormancy and exposed crowns and an open open winter. Conditions now are, are significantly significantly different, but with the moisture and growing conditions, I don't know. I, I, I've been away from the crop side long enough now. I don't remember where the critical temperature was on is on alfalfa, uh, 25, possibly approaching it. Certainly, it would be with some other crops. As I've driven the countryside in the northeast, I see a lot of wheat now that, even from the windshield, appears to be at least the three three leaf and possibly approaching the four leaf stage. Uh, guys around here got a pretty early jump on it, and somewhat to my surprise, as cold as the soil temperatures I thought were that. Obviously, the plants are telling us it was more than adequate for some pretty good growth. Anybody else have anything? I, I guess I concede there's not much to talk about, and that's a good thing. But we could make the opportunity here to bring up some other comments. Miranda, you have the Yeah, floor. Um, related to the drought, I had um, the Jeff, Jeff Prince, the range, state range from the NRCS, um, Want reached out to me regarding the drought calculator and if it's something that we would be interested in working on improving. Um, ARS developed it out of Fort Collins and he's gone as far as getting their approval for us to modify it if that's something you'd want to do because currently you have to upload your own precipitation data into it. It doesn't automatically load your current precipitation data. And then what it does is it gives you a growth curve 
and compares the growth curve based off of your precipitation to the standard growth curve. So if you're behind or ahead of your predicted growth for vegetation and range readiness. So this is that strictly on range readiness? It's it's developed for rangelands. Range. And it's developed for rangelands that are in um, reference type conditions. Okay. So there's there's some work that could be done to improve that as a tool. Thank you for that update. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Well, let's take this opportunity. There's any other current issues that need to be addressed, and one that's been in the news uh, for constantly is, of course, the the outbreak with the uh, 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 infections in the poultry flocks. Charlie pushed out a map. I think it was on Friday and showed everywhere from Rosso, Minnesota to uh, Madison, South Dakota and over to Jefferson in, in, in Wisconsin. So it is quite widespread, uh, extremely uh, uh, eminent that there is there is a problem there. And yeah. Iowa and Minnesota are the ones that really took the hit yeah. on this for some reason. And um, the other thing is uh, they're a little baffled on the transmission. It might actually be uh, via air aerosol from, and they don't know. Usually, they thought it was the wild birds, but the way it's behaving, it's acting more like a farm-to-farm -farm type transmission. And so, they're still kind of baffled as to what's really going on. All, all I want to do is maintain it, and we're good on the North Coast side. But biosecurity out there, we do not want to be part of anybody saying we're responsible for transmitting this disease. So be careful as you go on to operations and if you, you know, perchance go on a poultry operation you know be really careful you know walk in leave the car outside get your boots tie coveralls whatever uh, we just do not want to be accused of you know for inferred that we had any part of any transmissions question for you charlie when you say poultry operation these guys having 20 backyard chickens i mean the same level of concern um, because there's a lot of that out there. I'd say there's way more of that kind of casual contact with the smaller smaller flocks than anything else. Right. Uh, and Carl brings up a really good question. What do we do? And, and my, my sentiment on this is you really can't, you don't know. You don't know who's infected and who isn't. And so really you got to be careful even with the little flocks out there. And so you say, wow, that's a lot of work. Well, maybe you don't want to go to those right now. Uh, in the midst of an outbreak like this and you know what you can do by phone or other ways but it's you just don't know where it's at it doesn't matter if it's 20 hens or 20,000 um, it's the same rules apply thanks for those comments I think it really drives home the the importance of biosecurity whether in this case with poultry or our other operations you know that we can be very vulnerable as uh, in multi several states regions have canceled all of their poultry shows for county fall, county fairs and state fairs and so forth uh, and even though we don't regard in many cases of poultry as being a significant livestock uh, enterprise in in this state yet uh, when you start thinking about all the small farm flocks and, and, and include those it can be quite quite significant so uh, keep those uh, premises, uh, care, uh, approaching premises, uh, avoiding them in, in this case until things uh, get to get uh, get better. So I just had a question, JW, along those lines. We haven't done it for a few years. Is there a need for basic uh, biosecurity training on personal equipment, uh, clothing, uh, those types of issues? Just curious um, what the field force thinks out there. Your chance to speak. Uh, don't feel you're uh, out of touch because uh, you, you, you've not had the opportunity to participate in biosecurity training before. If that's a if that's an important uh, issue, if you feel uncomfortable with that, we can sure look at ways of providing some uh, update, whether that's in, a, in writing or a quick video or actually having having some on-site training. 
Any any thoughts on that? Primer will probably do us all good. Yeah, this is Mike in Grand Forks uh, as a new agent and knowing that there's a lot of new agents. Um, even in just our Northeast District, it might be a good idea to, to have some type of training like this. Point well taken, Michael. Thanks for speaking up. I see a couple of uh, comments going across the screen now that uh, you seem to be in uh, agree. Agree as well. Yeah, and Jerry, I think you sent out a kind of a little mm -hmm. index card, the checklist, or whatever. We have that developed from a few years ago. And, um, yeah, Miranda and I have actually been, had some conversations about doing this for agents, and and, and uh, so yeah, we're we're going to try and develop something. I think it's a good idea to just at least review for those already know, and if it's something new, that's even better. So yeah, it wouldn't, and it's not just on the livestock side. Um, I had one of my specialists on the crop side describe to me a situation where. Uh, they could see going into the field where someone went in and hmm. actually carried the pathogen into the field out to a monitoring site. Okay. So um, I think this would have more than just livestock ramifications. Very good. JW, this is Jackie. Go ahead. I was just wondering, we have not canceled our poultry show as of yet. Um, we were thinking about waiting until after the June 10th uh, Board of Animal Health meeting. Um, I guess I'm wondering what you think that we should do out in the counties as far as Charlie or Dr. Jerry. Yeah. Jackie, uh, the last communication that I had with Susan and her office is that I think she's strongly recommending that we don't have any of these poultry shows or sometimes even these little sales that take place that I'm really kind of unaware of. So that's where I guess our stance is right now. Let's not contribute to the problem by by uh, having more of these commingling events, if you will. So things could change, I understand, but right now I think that's where our stance is. Charlie, do you have anything to add to that? I think that's no, correct. No, Susan is pretty much, I, I'm pretty sure that Board of Animal Health is going to pass the policy and rules that they'll be all canceled. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. I just wanted to know, because we, we sent all of our materials to the youth, and so we were just wondering. Will um, exhibiting eggs be okay? Oh. You know. <laughs> because pathogen transmission of this thing is is really not well understood. <laughs> I know this sounds a little ridiculous, but I, I'm not sure I'd even go there. Um, I mean, that implies you've been on a poultry exhibiting eggs. Oh, okay. Um, and maybe Jerry, that would be a question you could go back to Susan with. Yeah, it could sure be. Address. Could be. You need to address that rather than uh, leaving us in limbo here. If I was, if I was totally. Um, if I totally understood the transmission thing, you know, maybe this is a lower risk, but still just it implies that somebody's been on a poultry operation and we're going to come together from several poultry operations. And apparently this thing is quite contagious, easily transmissible. And so for me, this is still a risk. So, but we can, I can visit with Susan's office on the egg deal. Angie, thanks for bringing that up. I think we had, uh, I would have been remiss in not talking about it because, uh, for obvious reasons, it, it, it is at least indirect contact, which we there's a lot we don't know about this shit. Um, Go ahead, the, Carl. This is a question for Jackie and some of the other agents out there. What what does your 4-H curriculum look like in terms of biosecurity? I'm just wondering, so, you know, you're talking about canceling shows and you're talking about doing that, and, you know, you turn lemons into lemonade. This could be a wonderful opportunity to convey a message about the importance of biosecurity to the youth involved in 4-H projects, and I, I just don't know if there's anything like that out there. Miranda and I have visited, and yet really there is not really anything written down. And so I've asked that, you know, some kind of a fact sheet be kind of penciled or drawn up so that we could have it for our youth. 
I know we'll probably be d discussing it at livestock camp, um, and I think Jerry can probably discuss that because he's going to be there. Right. Um, and so there really isn't anything formally written down. And right. most county fairs, I can tell you that they do not have any biosecurity issue, anything in place, especially in the sense of like foot baths or anything like that. I know that our fair, we have hand washing stations at every barn, and I know several of the others also do, and I know State Fair does, but there's not such a thing as a foot bath, and we need to make sure we encourage our youth not to use each other's equipment. Excellent point, Jackie. I would agree, this is Leisha, I would agree with what Jackie just said, but I think for me, one of my biggest concerns is more of what the leader's attitudes towards biosecurity is probably a little bit scarier than what the 4-H's are because they seem very laid back about it and, oh, don't worry about it. If something happens, we'll just take care of it, although they don't really want to put much in place. And so coming up with an idea of, of you know, maybe of a way we can ease into something like that to, or at least putting together a basic checklist of things to think about, I think would be really good for the 4-H program. Thank you, Alicia. Anyone else? Yeah, this is Craig. Um, I have no problems with any of this biosecurity stuff, but what's concerning to me is I guess I don't understand it completely, I'll be honest with that. So they don't bring their poetry to the fair. But obviously, they live on a poultry farm. They come to the fair. Can it spread to other things? Is there any issues with that? And the second thing that uh, state vet or somebody is going to have to do, and this is going to get touchy, is all these petting zoos that come to these fairs. And, and if we're have... going to shut down the poultry shows, we probably don't want chickens in the petting zoo, and I know a lot of them have them. So, you know, how far do you want to carry this? Yeah. And if we're going to go as far as saying agents can't respond to calls on farm visits with poetry, that's fine and dandy, but we better have some backing from somebody saying that we can't do this. Otherwise, as agents, we're going to be in some confrontational situations, I can see. First of all, never said not to uh, make visits is be, be very aware of the biosecurity. And the other things on, on visits, do, does it require an on-farm visit? If it does, certainly do them. And as we talked about in previous training, if you can do one farm a visit a day, don't do multiple poultry in one day. Change the clothing between and boots and, and use the garbage bags to put the your uh, exposed clothing in so you can wash them and clean them up before you hit the next one. I mean, those are the things going on. Craig, also the, uh, the risk of cross-species transmission of avian influenza, it seems to be confined strictly to birds and poultry. It doesn't seem to be, you know, and I'm saying this not knowing all the answers, okay, but there doesn't seem to be risk for other species at the present. Uh, now just between us, this crowd here, influenza is a virus that can mutate and can change its spots, but right now it just seems to be a bird and poultry issue. I'm glad you brought up the that, Craig. It was, there's lots to here to think about and was the reason that I added this to the agenda last minute this morning, just thinking about uh, potential challenges and thinking past just our own 4-H program or our producers, but petting zoos and what have you. And anytime you have a, a grave concern, then the perceived, uh, there are certain things that are perceived and, and people start jumping to conclusions, so we want to keep everybody in, in the know. I hear then that uh, we want some form of an update on biosecurity. I think it would be appropriate to have all extension specialists as, uh, involved in that, uh, authorship in it, uh, not only for their own credit, but for to, to acknowledge that the, all the industries are thinking about and continue to remind people of the importance of biosecurity. Any other requests related to this?
anything else you'd like to bring up for the good of the order, take this opportunity. I blocked off an hour for today, and we certainly don't need to burn up an hour, but I want to allow Tottenham for some other conversation. Uh, Dr. Charlie? I was going to say, are you going to, uh, what, uh, recess the drought meetings now for a while? Um, but that doesn't mean you don't want to come back on another issue. Well, that was the next item on the agenda. And my, my question to you is, do we want to, at least for planning purposes, meet again in two weeks? And, of course, we can always cancel it if it's not necessary. Or we could use that opportunity to address other topics that may have emerged. And I would guess that uh, the biosecurity issue is not going not to disappear with, with uh, the drought. Any comments out in yonder hinterlands? The what are the earliest, the table? What are the earliest fairs starting? Just kind of want a rough timeline of what we what are we dealing with here mm -hmm. on the biosecurity, especially some information for the. If there are some June fairs out there. Who has uh, earliest? I know Botanos is June 11th. That's the earliest one I know of that I've been asked to help at. Yeah, they've traditionally been about the first county fair that uh, that I'm aware of. We talked about trying to get something out by livestock camp so they could get all get it to kids there. And the the date on livestock camp for everyone's benefit? It is the week of June eighth, right? I believe. June eighth. And that encompasses all species? Uh just beef, sheep, swine, dairy. Um, but there was supposed to be a uh rabbit and small animal uh, events there as well. And so I'm not sure. I haven't talked to Monique what her plans are. Well, I guess that would be next on your agenda. <laughs> Thank you for making that contact, Jackie. Okay. Jackie, are you in your office today? Um, not till this afternoon. Okay. I have a drought... Uh, range camp meeting okay. um, here at 10. Okay. I need to visit with you sometime today. I'll give you a call later. Okay, Jerry. Okay, that brings us to the uh, to the end of uh, existing conversation. Last opportunity to bring up something uh, of importance to the ag sector. If you have something you'd like to share. You'll have to look at the date. I think it's Memorial Day in two weeks. The text ah, came yes. up on the screen, so you might just look at some. Yes, I haven't even opened the calendar yet. Would somebody take a there. look at that? And the crops team call is on Tuesday morning, and the hort is on Tuesday. Wednesday, maybe? I can't remember. So you don't want to. Somebody out there, when is the hort calls? Tom Cal just put an email out this morning. Wednesday, yep. Wednesdays, okay. That's Thank more. You so in the crops calls Tuesday mornings at 7.50. So go for an hour and a half. Okay, that does put us in a bit of a, a bind. Why don't you just back it to June 1st? be three weeks. Is that the difference? I think that's uh, very tolerable. Anybody else? You don't have to affirm. I'm going to assume that's what everybody wants unless you see a conflict with that. Uh, the suggestion has been made for June 1st. Everybody okay with that, appears? All right. So we'll make it June 1st. And hope we have nothing but good news to talk about on, on June 1st. All right. Well, thank you all for your participation, updates. And, of course, if something else comes up, so don't hesitate to share it with us. Anything else around the table? Seeing none. Last call out in out state. Anything? All right. Very good. We'll see you in three weeks. Thanks. Thank you.